It is extremely common to find reviews of today's film warning not to be fooled by the cheesy title. That it's surprisingly a much better movie than you'd expect. Back in the late 50s, it was easy for audiences and critics to overlook the deeper meanings and horror in sci-fi. I think it is time to put that mentality behind us and finally embrace the sophistication and craft put into one of the great 1950s alien invasion pictures. This is the Brandon's Monster Morgue autopsy of I Married a Monster from Outer Space. After the success of directing the Herman Cohen produced I Was a Teenage Werewolf for AIP, Gene Fowler Jr. left the company and teamed up with writer Louis Vittis. The two copied Cohen's formula of creating a story around an outrageous title, but they ensured a good script and serious direction went along with it. And thus, I Married a Monster from Outer Space was born. It was their intention to bait the audience and critics with the name. Personally, I feel the movie itself is still overshadowed by its title. I Married a Monster from Outer Space is a different kind of alien plot from the all-out attacks and takeovers of other 1950s invaders. These creatures are more methodical. We see them communicating with one another, trying whatever they can to execute their plan. The aliens here are after procreation to ensure the survival of their species. Through the point of view of our heroine Marge, played by Gloria Talbot, I Married a Monster from Outer Space explores adult themes such as troubled marriages, impotence, and that perfect facade of 1950s suburbia. Plus, with talks of impregnation and implications of sex and prostitution, this is a much more risque alien movie. It even begins with a couple making out in a car, oblivious to their surroundings. A year after marrying Bill, Marge realizes he is not the man she fell in love with. Literally. Bill has been replaced with a monster from outer space, and he's not the only man in town who has fallen victim to this intergalactic deviance. Other husbands in Marge's circle of friends, and even the police, have their own alien doppelgangers. She stumbles upon the truth, and her alien husband reveals to her that all the females of his kind have died out. He and the other males from his planet are taking over the bodies of human men in an attempt to breed with Earth women and ensure the survival of their species. This is a much more cynical movie than you would expect from a 1950s alien flick. The late 40s and early 50s saw a boom in marriages, followed by an increase in divorces. As idyllic as suburbia is often portrayed in films, at least on the outside, with the exception of our protagonist, there is a lack of squeaky clean people. The neighborhood is full of thugs, drunks, aliens in disguise, and floozies. Even Marge's friend Helen treats marriage as something to display on the mantle, wanting to get married simply because it's the thing to do. And for money. Helen embodies everything negative this movie has to say about how marriage was viewed at the time. The storyline is not afraid to get downright upsetting either. Two dogs and a cat lose their lives to these nasty aliens, but the animals do get their revenge. The German shepherds are more heroic than the actual men during the ending raid on the alien ship. One of the courageous canines was the director's own animal companion, Anna the police dog. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of I Married a Monster from Outer Space is that the aliens' plan to impregnate our planet's women does not work and they get frustrated by this. As we watch the aliens get used to their human outer casings, we learn that these creatures each have individual personalities and even disagreements about how to go about their overall plan. The main story picks up a year after the title marriage, and they are still no closer to their goal. They make mistakes and even get depressed like humans. The aliens were brought to life by Charles Gamora, who made two suits for the film which were reused to make it seem like there were more. The script reveals the lead creature to us within the first five minutes, not concerning itself with any superfluous mystery. The fear of this film comes from what these aliens do, not what they look like. Gamora was a special effects man initially known for making and performing in gorilla suits. Horror fans may recognize him from 1932's Murders in the Rue Morgue and as the Martian from 1953's The War of the Worlds. Gamora would inject air into his foam latex mixture, making the material more flesh-like. He also developed a fake blood that wouldn't stain fabric. 
It has been said that the ball-shaped mouth and tubing in the chest were supposed to be a breathing apparatus, and through a misunderstanding of the description of the aliens, the device became part of the creature's body. I couldn't find any confirmation for this story, but it would answer the question of what are these aliens breathing if the Earth's oxygen is poisonous to them. All I could find is that the tubes were Fowler's idea. Director Gene Fowler Jr. thought Gamora's alien suits were scary enough without the glowing effect. They are great suits, but I do think the glow helps prevent that feeling of watching actors running around in rubber suits. Even though the movie is in black and white, the aliens were a dark, frog-like green. Star Thomas Tryon had an important influence on the monsters during the first day of filming. When he was shown a photograph of the alien suit wearing a pair of glittering shorts, he tore the picture up and proclaimed, I'm not going to be in this movie until you change those pants. Fowler had the design modified immediately. Gloria Talbot agreed with her co-star, even saying the monster looked like a male stripper with the shorts. It was known on set that Tryon did not want to do the movie anyway. Fowler felt Tryon gave a wooden performance because of his lack of enthusiasm for the project, but lightened up once a friendship formed between the actor and director. John P. Fulton, a master of mats and opticals, handled the visual effects. He is the one who made the Invisible Man invisible in 1933. In fact, if you've seen a universal horror movie from the 30s, you've seen Fulton's work. He was responsible for a number of effects in I Married a Monster from Outer Space, including the alien's luminance, the sinister black smoke, a double exposure of a bug crawling on Bill's lifeless body, which you can see through, and of course, the famous lightning shot, revealing the alien's face beneath the human disguise. The creature was superimposed on top of the image at 75% exposure. One effect that the director's wife helped out with is the dissolving aliens. The soupy fluid they melt into when they perish was nothing more than three gallons of jello prepared by Marjorie Fowler. A foot pump was used on set to make the jello pulsate. Paramount released I Married a Monster from Outer Space in 1958 as the A picture in a double bill with the blob. To save money, Paramount bought the blob, rather than produce their own B picture. Despite featuring space aliens coming down to Earth, these two sci-fi horror flicks couldn't be more different. The blob is in color and aimed at a teen audience. I Married a Monster from Outer Space is black and white and has a more grown-up story. Audiences preferred the deluxe color experience of the blob, so I Married a Monster from Outer Space was relegated to the B picture. As much as I love The Blob, let's face it, that movie does have its slow parts. The story in I Married a Monster from Outer Space keeps moving. Gene Fowler Jr.'s attitude towards editing was to simply let the editor do their job with no supervision until the end of post-production. He trusted his old army buddy, George Tomasini, with the cutting. Being Alfred Hitchcock's editor at the time, Tomasini knew a thing or two about building suspense. Fowler himself primarily worked as an editor throughout his career, and even edited for Fritz Lang. He actually considered Lang as his directorial mentor, particularly in terms of lighting scenes to match the desired mood. He also subscribes to Lang's storytelling philosophy of, no matter how bad the bad guy is, the bad guy thinks he is good. The aliens, while resorting to nefarious means, are ultimately trying to ensure the survival of their species. We may not be on board with their plan, but we understand it. Fowler's influence as an editor can be illustrated with how he handled his sets. Star Gloria Talbot once called him amazing because he had us do very few takes. He knew exactly what he wanted as if he was editing while directing. Oftentimes, Fowler would just do one take. The actors loved working with Gene, but writer Lou Vittis is a slightly different story. Vittis would hang out on set, usually sitting by the camera, mouthing the lines along with the actors. Gloria Talbot and Thomas Tryon found this to be distracting, especially since they weren't initially aware that this was the writer of their dialogue. Gene Fowler Jr. and Lou Vittis were a writer-director partnership working together multiple times, but never again in the horror and sci-fi genres. The only other creature feature written by Vitus was Monster from Green Hell, before he partnered with Fowler's direction. 
I Married a Monster from Outer Space is one of the best alien films of the 50s. Gene Fowler Jr. set out to direct a movie that was better than its title, and I think he succeeded. Wanting to move on from exploitation, this was his last foray as a director into horror. Unfortunately, his directing career came to an abrupt end from being blacklisted. He went back to the world of editing, where he was nominated for an Oscar for It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, and became the supervising editor of made-for-TV horrors such as Don't Be Afraid of the Dark and Bad Ronald. It's too bad his time as a horror director was short-lived. Gene Fowler Jr. cared about his craft, separating him from other low-budget horror directors of the time. He put thought into the placement and movement of the camera and how to light the scene. He produced I Married a Monster from Outer Space himself, and compared to working with Cohen on I Was a Teenage Werewolf, you can tell he was set on bigger ideas. I Married a Monster from Outer Space is not the campy schlock that many assume it is based on the title. Aliens and low budgets do not equate a lack of ideas. This is one 50s flick you will want to be married to. Was it true? Could space monsters mate with Earth women? See the startling answer in the shocker of them all.